Welcome everyone. Um, so I'm Peter Bergen. I, I run the International Security Program at New America, which is hosting this uh, um, webinar. Uh, we are <clears throat> hosting the webinar to uh, basically to mark the release of uh, the new report uh, by commissioned by the James Foley Foundation, uh, the 2020 report, Bringing Americans Home. Uh, we have a, a, a very good group of people to discuss the report, um, starting with Diane Foley, the president of the James Foley Foundation, uh, the author of the report, Cindy Lurcher, uh, and also the primary researcher on the report, uh, Lisa Monaco, uh, who is a senior fellow at the NYU School of Law, and also, of course, the former uh, assistant to President Obama for both Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. Uh, and finally, Rachel Briggs, who's the executive director of Hostage US. Uh, so um, let me start by handing it over to Diane, and she's going to make some opening remarks and then hand it over to Cindy. Thank you. A warm welcome to our distinguished panel and to all of you who are um, taking time to join us remotely today. The coronavirus is currently holding us all hostage here in the United States and around the world, keeping us away from dear family and friends. Many of us, uh, most of us are unable to travel, many unable to work or even go outside. This is just an inkling of what it is like to be taken hostage or wrongfully detained in which case all freedoms are taken away. The 10 public cases of long-held Americans hostages listed on our website are the faces of our citizens currently suffering this ordeal. But they are just a fraction of the hundreds of Americans who are taken hostage or wrongfully detained every year. This confidential report is about actual U.S. citizens struggling to survive in captivity and their families desperately trying to bring them home. This 2020 Bringing Americans Home report is offered in memory of two brave Americans who tragically died in captivity this year. It is offered in memory of Robert Levinson, a dedicated FBI agent who was held captive in Iran for 13 years, and to Mustafa Qasem, a, brow, a proud Egyptian American held captive for seven years in Egypt. This work is dedicated with deep gratitude to our esteemed colleague, Rachel Briggs, the Executive Director of Hostage US, who joins us on the panel today. Thank you, Rachel. Though a British citizen, Rachel saw the, our desperate need here in the US and had the moral courage to leave her country in 2015 and spend the last five years in Washington, DC, building the nonprofit Hostage US, which is a nonprofit to support families of American hostages and returned hostages. We are indebted and forever grateful to you, Rachel, for your gift of time and talents to all of us here in the United States. And before we begin, I must thank Cindy Lurcher, the researcher and committed author of this report, and New America's Peter Bergen, David Sturman and their wonderful team at New America, without which none of this would have been possible. Thank you all. So, um, Cindy. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Lurcher, and I first would like to thank you, Peter Bergen and David Sturman and New America for their continued support and for launching the second Bringing Americans Home report. It's also a great privilege to discuss these findings here with Diane Foley, Lisa Monaco, and Rachel Briggs. But before I begin, I'd like to share one thing about how difficult it was for families before the implementation of the current hostage policy, Presidential Policy Directive 30, known as PPD 30. Before the implementation of PPD 30, the current former hostage policy was NSPD 12, 
which was an entirely classified document which lacked family engagement and other components to support hostages and their families. PPD 30 and Executive Order 13698, issued by former President Obama, created institutions to take rapid coordinated action in support to take hostage taking event by standing up the hostage recovery fusion cell, which I'll refer to as the HRFC during this, this talk, and the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, also known as the SVIHA. The HRC and the SVIHA office has been essential for bringing Americans home and has been an incredible source for support for these families. All of our participants expressed their gratitude for having these resources and underscored the importance of continued support from the HRC and the SVIHA's office. This year's report, Bringing Americans Home 2020, was written from the perspective of former hostages, former wrongful detainees, and families of current and former hostages and wrongful detainees. This report includes 25 interviews conducted between 2019 through February 2020, and all of our responses are representative of their experiences during the year of 2019. The study represents eight hostage cases and eight wrongful detainee cases, totaling 16 separate cases. So next, I'll, I'll go over some of our findings, and our results show that the hostage participants interacted with the HRC and the SVIHA's office, while wrongful detainee participants typically worked with the SVIHA's office only. Wrongful detainee participants also interacted with the Bureau of Consular Affairs, especially when a detention was not classified as, a, as wrongful by the U.S. government. Therefore, we included Consular Affairs in its examination of the experiences of wrongful detainees. So next slide. Participants were asked whether the HRC, SPIHA's office and consular affairs were accessible to them and where a majority of hostage and wrongful detainee participants agreed or mostly agreed. Most hostage participants agreed that they can reach out and call the HRC at any time of the day. However, some expressed a decrease in accessibility with the HRC for reintegration purposes for example, how long do former, former hostages have access to the HRC after their return home? Access to the SVIHA's office for wrongful detainee participants was solely dependent on whether participants' case was considered a wrongful detention. Participants shared that they remained working with consular affairs until their case was classified as a wrongful detention by the government. Additionally, several wrongful detainee participants expressed their concern over not having access to the SVIHA because they believed that their case was really a hostage situation because their loved one was being held as a political pawn. One, partic one participant shared, at some point working with consular affairs is not enough because they need a diplomatic solution to their case. Next slide. Participants were then asked if they understood the roles and responsibilities of the HRC, SPIHA, and consular affairs office. The majority of the hostage part respondents agreed and had had a clear understanding of the HRFC's role. However, responses were a little more mixed regarding this FIHA's office. A common frustration shared by hostage participants was over confusion about whether the HRC or SVIHA's office was the lead agency in charge of their case. In some cases, there were, was confusion within the organizations themselves. According to one participant, neither the HRC nor the SVIHA's office was clear on which organization should be leading their case. This occurred when an individual was, suspect, was suspected to be held by a foreign government, but the foreign government had not acknowledged the detention. These cases are usually viewed as unacknowledged detentions and are treated as hostage cases by the US government. This type of confusion with the hostage recovery enterprise was upsetting for hostage participants who were, frustra who were frustrated that the bureaucratic confusion was hampering efforts to secure their loved one's release and potentially extending their loved one's captivity. Wrongful detainee participants had a general understanding of the role of the SVIHA's office in consular affairs, stating that consular affairs was responsible for visiting their family members in prison, checking on their overall wellness, as well as determining if their loved one is being fed, receiving legal representation, or are being subjected to inhumane treatments such as torture and or solitary confinement. What remains unclear for some of our participants was if consular affairs was responsible for engaging with foreign governments in, more, in a more diplomatic manner. Also, while wrongful detainee participants generally understood the role of the SVIHA's office, there was some confusion about what tools the SVIHA had to secure the love, their loved one's release. 
For instance, one participant asked, can this FIHA make con concessions? Can they provide aid to a foreign government? Arrange prisoner swaps? Specifically, what can this FIHA legally do? Next slide, please. Participants were then asked to what degree they are satisfied with the rate they received information regarding their loved one's case from the HRC, SFIHA's Office and Consular Affairs. Hostage participants in general responded favorably to both the HRC and the SFIHA's office, but still remain concerned about the level of completeness of the information they received. Some hostage participants found that there, there's important information they received right away, especially from the HRC. Other hostage participants were much less satisfied with the U.S. government's information sharing, where one participant said that they felt that the government shared insufficient information regarding their loved one's case. This left many feeling as though they did not have all the details and that they had no choice but to just trust the U.S. government blindly. Regardless of the hostage respondent's satisfaction with the government's information sharing, most brought up frustrations with the lack of declassification of information. Participants express a desire to have increased access to information surrounding their loved one's cases, incomplete, <clears throat> incomplete, including complete, full, and timely access to all information and activities. Several participants requested that the government create a mechanism through which they could receive an interim limited security clearance in order to allow them to view the classified material pertinent to their case. On the other hand, wrongful detainee participants were generally dissatisfied with the level of communication with the U.S. government related to their case. Similar to hostage participants, one of the main concerns wrongful detainee participants shared involved classification issues as well. Another frustration raised by wrongful detainee participants involved a lack of inter interagency coordination and information sharing. For instance, one participant shared that they have to, have to be the one to go from department to department to share information, not only for their loved one, but for the efforts of the departments and agencies as well. Next slide, please. Next, participants were asked if they agreed or disagreed in if the return of their loved one was a priority of the U.S. government. Overall, hostage participants generally agreed that the U.S. government considers their case a priority, whereas wrongful detainee participants had negative responses similar to those of families of hostages prior to the implementation of PPD-30. One of the main issues hostage families raised was their concern that the HRFC and the SFIHA's office do not have enough authority to push their case to the priority level they think is required to achieve resolution to their case. One family member commented, if they don't have a seat at the table, meaning the National Security Council Deputies Committee or Principals Meeting, it's a lot harder to have hostage issues as a top priority. Some participants responded favorably to the former SFIHA, Robert O'Brien, becoming the National Security Advisor. For, from their perspective, this potentially raises the priority level of their loved one's case. Some wrongful detainee participants shared that by not having the highest levels of government highlighting their case shows a lack of priority the U.S. government places on their case. Another participant shared that it would show that their loved one, it, loved one is a priority if the president, secretary of state, or national security advisor would publicly address their case. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna discuss key concerns that were raised amongst hostage and wrongful detainee families. The first being recovery efforts shared with hostages and wrongful detainee participants. This study found that there are concerns over coordination between the HRFC and the Department of Defense. Some participants shared their concerns that the Department of Defense was withholding information from the HRFC and acting unilaterally without notifying the HRFC about details in the current, in the current status of their case. Some participants argued that the HRC standing within the U.S. government should be increased in order to prevent the Department of Defense from bypassing the HRC. The next issue that was raised was over the impact of definitions between a hostage and a wrongful detainee. The U.S. government classifies individuals as either hostages or detainees based on the identity of the group holding them, whether it is a non-state actor or state actor. Criminal and terrorist kidnappings are violations of U.S. law, and in these cases, the FBI will open up a case, either using material support for terrorism or criminal kidnapping statutes. As a result, the HRFC is able to access funds from the Victims of Crime Act of 1984 to support hostage family members. When, the, when US nationals are detained by foreign government, 
governments. And those governments acknowledge that detention. No U.S. laws are broken since governments generally have the authority to arrest and detain individuals within their own borders. This then creates a challenge for supporting families as they do not qualify for the Victims of Crime Act funding the way that hostage families do. Further, the Department of State does not have a funding mechanism uh, for providing a similar kind of support for wrongful detention cases. Another key concern that was raised was about wrongful detainee access to the hostage recovery fusion cell. PPD 30 states, again the hostage policy, states that in dealing with cases where a foreign government confirms that it has detained a U.S. national, the Department of State may draw on the full range of experience and expertise of the HRFC as appropriate, including the HRFC's Family Engagement Coordinator. It is unclear, however, what it means to draw upon the full range of experience and expertise of the personnel at the HRFC. Do the HRFC's personnel serve as advisors to individuals within the SPIHA's office? Does the HRFC become actively engaged in these cases? If so, does state retain its status as a lead agency for the case? Also, does the HRFC become responsible for funding support to these cases? Even if these questions were answered, who determines which, case are, which cases are authorized to draw upon the HRFC's resources? The lack of clarity on when and how the Department of State is able to draw upon support from the HRFC has, clear, has created a significant level of confusion about which organization is responsible for their cases among the families of acknowledged wrongful detainees. Additionally, wrongful detainee participants have expressed a need to better understand how and when their cases can receive support from the HRFC. Receiving this clarity would help wrongful detainee families better understand where to place their efforts in advocating for their loved ones. So what makes a difference uh, what makes a detainee a wrongful detainee? In addition to the lack of clarity of how wrongful detainees access the HRC, there is confusion over what makes a detention case wrongful, thereby gaining access to the SFIHA's office. In general, families have expressed concern that these guidelines are not that, that these guidelines are classified and are not shared. Currently, there is no unclassified publicly available definition of what makes a detention wrongful. This ultimately limits resources and available experts, expertise to help bring resolution to their cases. Another concern that was raised uh, was over the vacancy of this FIHA. Overall, most families commented that the, di that the differences in working with an appointed FIHA and enacting FIHA were substantial. In general, families noted that progress in their cases overall and specifically diplomatic efforts to resolve their case slowed significantly during the vacancy. Additional, additionally, participants noted that during this time frame, there were a number of vacant positions within the office normally held by career diplomats. On a happy note, um, the, the, the current administration has announced the nomination of a new pre special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, Robert Carsons, to fill the, the role. The last concern that I'll mention before I conclude was access to senior policymakers. Families express concerns that hostage and wrongful detainee cases do not have the appropriate standing to influence the very various agencies within the U.S. government involved in resolving hostage and wrongful detainee cases. Participants shared that they feel as though their cases are missing top-level engagement within the U.S. government. Participants are often told that particular issues related to their cases are going to be decided at the deputies committee within the National Security Council. In both administrations, however, neither the director of the HRFC nor the SPIHA was a member of the deputies committee. Both hostage and wrongful detainee participants stated that former SPIHA Robert O'Brien's assumption of the national security role was helpful for increasing the priority of their cases, further highlighting the need for a voice within the White House to address hostage and detainee concerns. So as I conclude, uh, overall, the changes made to the U.S. government's hostage recovery enterprise has improved the experiences of the families of hostages and to a lesser extent wrongful detainees. There have been significant improvements since the implementation of PPD-30, the creation of the hostage recovery fusion cell, and the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs continues to be viewed as a successful mechanism for increasing the accessibility of the U.S. government to the families of both hostages and wrongful wrongfully held detainees. In general, the restructuring of the U.S. government's hostage recovery enterprise has had a positive impact 
and has largely been successful. The efforts of the HRFC in the Sfiha's office to secure the release of Americans held abroad should, con should continue to be a priority of U.S. foreign policy. Additionally, responsible changes to policy should be considered to expand support to the families of those U.S. nationals wrongfully held by foreign governments. Before I conclude, I, I strongly want to encourage you to take a look at the appendices A and B of Bringing Americans Home 2020. There you'll find an extensive list of current needs and recommendations shared by our hostage and wrongful detainee participants. And finally, hostage taking by terrorist groups and wrongful detentions of Americans will continue to be a pressing concern as militants and adversarial governments continue to seek ways to find leverage with the United States. In this increasing hostile environment, the recovery of Americans and the provision of support for these families should continue to be a priority of any administration seeking to place its interests of Americans first. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. So now we'll hear from Lisa Monaco. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, and thank you uh, in particular to Diane Foley and to the Foley Foundation for uh, commissioning this report. Uh, the second uh, of its kind, and to Cindy for the tremendous work you've, you've done on this. I'm very grateful to be a, a member of the Foley Foundation's Advisory Council, uh, so it's wonderful to see this work getting done. Thanks to Peter and New America for sponsoring this, uh, and to Hostage US and my fellow uh, panelist, Rachel Briggs, um, on whose board for Hostage US that I'm privileged to serve. It's, uh, it's terrific uh, to see this dedication to Rachel and her terrific work, uh, and of course, uh, the wonderful and I think appropriate dedication to Robert Levinson and Mustafa Kassim. So let me do a few things, uh, if I could, uh, in my uh, comments here, uh, and obviously we'll welcome questions both from the, from the participants in this as well as from the, my co-panelists. Uh, I want to step back uh, a few minutes and talk about the reasons behind the uh, 2015 hostage policy review because I think it's a good way to frame uh, the important work that the 2020 report that we're here discussing has done in evaluating the efficacy uh, of those reforms. Uh, and then I'll uh, make a few comments on uh, some of the select, a few uh, select recommendations that I want to pull out uh, from the report and comment on. Um, with regard to the 2015 uh, policy review and the results of that review, uh, as has been noted in the report that we're discussing today, uh, that 2015 review and the recommendations that came uh, from it grew out of tremendous tragedy. Um, and frankly, the failure of the US government to do right by the families of uh, US citizens held hostage abroad. Uh, as President Obama said at the time in June of 2015, when the results of the review and the uh, reforms were announced, there were times when our government, um, frankly, let down uh, the families of Americans uh, held unjustly abroad and that we needed to do better. And I think he uh, very appropriately quoted Diane Foley at the time saying that we as Americans needed to do better. Uh, and so that was the reason behind the 2015 review. I, at the time in 2014, after the uh, horrible tragedies uh, suffered, uh, Jim Foley's death, Peter Kasich, Stephen Sotloff, Kayla Mueller, um, I recommended to President Obama that we conduct a wholesale, uh, full and comprehensive review of hostage policy. Um, and uh, the president directed his national security team uh, and frankly his government to engage uh, in that review. It became clear very early on that the hostage policy that we had been operating under and frankly the structure of our government was built for a different time and frankly for a different problem than the one that we faced in 2014. Uh, it was not set up, our government was not set up and our policy was not aligned to deal with stateless actors operating in, in ungoverned spaces um, or uh, with non-existent governments. Uh, we were a sprawling intelligence and law enforcement and policy apparatus uh, engaged in frankly an outmoded approach to hostage issues and, and issues confronting unlawful 
uh, and wrongful detainees. So the review was directed by President Obama, um, and the review really engendered a very hard and painful look at uh, what the US government had been doing uh, and uh, what it frankly had not been doing uh, appropriately. When that review got underway, um, a tremendous professional um, in the National Security Council staff, Jen Easterly, known to many of you, uh, came to me and said there were two, and she was quite, quite prescient about this, she said there's two things we absolutely have to make sure we get done in this review. We have to be transparent in how we're conducting it, and we absolutely have to be guided by and informed uh, by the families of those held unjustly abroad and be informed by and learn from their experiences. So the families have to be included in this review. And under the leadership of General Bennett Sokolik um, at the National Counterterrorism Center, he led a team uh, to conduct the accounting and the review that did include uh, discussing at length with families and returned hostages. And what we what that review revealed, uh, as has been documented, was silos of information, disorganization, lack of transparency and information sharing with families, and at times a lack of appropriate focus. And I say that um, notwithstanding the tremendous um, good work and good intentions and hard work of um, professionals across the government, but we were not operating in a way that reflected uh, the problem that we were facing. So the result was the reforms uh, of that, the result of that review was the report um, that uh, came out in January, in June rather of 2015, um, that was shared first with families of hostages, uh, as well as returned hostages. It was shared with the public. It resulted in the executive order that Cindy mentioned uh, and a new policy, PPD 30, as has been referenced. Um, and that policy and those structures and that executive order directed a new governmental approach um, and frankly, a new orientation, all of which was designed to put families at the center of our hostage enterprise and our focus. Um, and the other thing I think is very important in it, in it is what brings us in many respects here today, which is the fact that we made a conscious decision to do something unusual with regard to executive orders and documents like PPD 30, which is to say we made them deliberately unclassified. We made them public documents. And the reason we did that, and it was very, very conscious, we did it so that we could be having this discussion today. We did it precisely so that future administrations, future um, gatherings of families and returned hostages, future journalists, uh, future members of non-governmental organizations would be doing exactly this, would be having this discussion, talking about um, and evaluating the efficacy of the reforms that were put in place in 2015, and frankly, holding the government's feet to the fire. Um, that is what uh, we as uh, citizens should be doing. It's what journalists should be doing. Uh, and it is something that the government should welcome. And we, we put in place, uh, we made these unclassified documents and frankly put in place a requirement uh, for a report um, from, a, from the government, uh, that the government conduct a report and, a re and review as well uh, to gauge the effectiveness of implementation of these policies. So, um, so kudos, of course, to the Foley Foundation and New America for uh, engaging in this accounting and holding uh, our, our collective feet to the fire. So the three areas of review and um, policy change uh, that I just want to mention in terms of the, the results of the 2015 review, because I think they're important to come back to as we evaluate how, um, how well we are doing as a nation in terms of addressing uh, the challenges and, and the gaps that we were trying to fill in 2015. Um, the three areas I always come back to when I try and gauge how we're doing on this is um, the structure and organization of our government uh, in terms of addressing hostage issues and unlawful detainee issues, 
Uh, second, our policy orientation and how well we are implementing uh, the changes in policy. And third is the how well we are doing at reorienting our um, focus and our sense of priority. And here I mean placing families at the center and being and viewing families as partners in the hostage recovery uh, enterprise. That's how we kind of organized the review in 2015 and the results of it. And as has been mentioned, um, the structure changes we put in place in 2015 as a result of the review uh, were many, but I'll highlight three. Uh, of course, the hostage recovery fusion cell that Cindy mentioned, which is envisioned as the central operational hub sitting outside the White House, outside the National Security Council, the place to be the central hub for all information and intelligence to come into from across the government. Uh, importantly, as a, that uh, information goes to the hostage recovery fusion cell to be evaluated by um, all the relevant people in the government focused on hostage issues who sit side by side uh, from across the different agencies in the government to focus on these issues. And importantly, it's also the role of the hostage recovery fusion cell to evaluate that information on a regular basis to be shared back out with hostage families um, and the families of wrongful detainees. Uh, that was explicitly envisioned as a role and a mission a part of the hostage recovery fusion cells um, mission. And so I think it's something we should come back to as we evaluate how well they're, they're doing on that mission. The uh, second uh, structural change was also mentioned by Cindy, which is the creation of the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs at the State Department, a senior diplomat. This was a specific recommendation uh, of uh, the review coming from Diane Foley, from David Bradley. Uh, it was absolutely an important um, and prescient recommendation. And so the creation of that senior most diplomat at the State Department was a specific uh, structural change. But there was also another structural change that Cindy didn't mention um, that I think is very important and is at the root of some of the gaps that the 2020 report identifies. The very important creation in the 2015 review um, was the hostage response group. This was the group created inside the National Security Council. Uh, to be led by the special assistant to the president um, for counterterrorism issues at the time, uh, Jen Easterly, later uh, succeeded by Josh Geltzer, Chris Costa. Um, the person leading the hostage response group inside the National Security Council uh, reported directly uh, to me in my former role as Homeland Security Advisor uh, and had a direct line to the president um, in that in that role. The hostage response group was created to be the coordinating point, the place that the senior most uh, levels of the government come together to ensure that there is prioritization and a championing of hostage issues and uh, the issues of unlawful detainees inside at the senior most levels of the government. So I want to come back to that when we talk about some of the gaps and the recommendations identified, because uh, that was envisioned as the place to coordinate uh, and have the, the priority setting um, and issues to get resolved inside at the senior most levels of the government. When it comes to, to policy issues, of course, the PBD 30 um, reoriented uh, our policy around um, making sure families, as I said, were at the center. Uh, and we're partners in the enterprise. Um, and of course, the HRFC reflected that in the uh, creation of the family engagement coordinator role. <clears throat> Excuse me. So having a dedicated person within the HRFC to serve as, a, as the main source of and point of contact and continued in regular contact with families and returning hostages. Uh, to ensure that families are getting timely and accurate information and that information and intelligence is being shared with them and that families have a voice within the government. Importantly, the family um, engagement coordinator and the, and the family engagement team housed at the HRFC um, 
was always envisioned, and this is laid out in the original documents, always envisioned as including both the FBI's Office of Victim Affairs, or uh, Office of Victim Assistance, excuse me, as well as the State Department's Consular Affairs. So as we talk about the disparity between how detainees, wrongful detainees, and their families are being treated and hostages, um, we should remember that the original conception of the family engagement team and that function in the HRFC was envisioned to include both um, family engagement for both um, sets of hostages and uh, detainees and their families. Um, so let me just go quickly to, because uh, I know we want to get to questions, to um, my reaction to a few of the recommendations that I will uh, I'll comment on. Um, first, all credit to Cindy and the work that was done and the people who participated in this report. Um, it's incredibly valuable, as I said, to continue to hold, uh, hold us all accountable for the continued efficacy of these reforms. Um, but I must say, as I was reading it, um, I was concerned because I detected some themes that um, were eerily reminiscent of some of the issues, many of the issues that we identified in the original 2015 review and that we sought to remedy and address with the reforms that we've just discussed. Uh, and I'll pull out three the disparate treatment between hostages and wrongful detainees and the, and the kind of slippage between left hand and right hand when it comes to the government dealing uh, as between the State Department and the FBI. That was a recurring theme um, before the 2015 reforms. The second issue is silos of, of information and irregular communication with families um, and a dissatisfaction and frankly frustration that came through in the 2020 report was very reminiscent of the same views that I heard uh, and that we all heard in conducting the 2015 review uh, when it comes to um, dissatisfaction with the level of information being shared with families. And third, this lack of a central coordination and prioritization point. That is something uh, that we heard before the 2015 reforms um, and something, of course, as I said, we tried to remedy um, both with the hostage response group, seating that at the National Security Council, um, and frankly, in the role that I performed as the Homeland Security Advisor to the President, who had direct responsibility and viewed it as my job to coordinate and make sure our reforms were getting implemented and to be a source of constant communication, quite frankly, with families and, uh, and then taking those views and those concerns in my daily and meetings with the president. And I met with him every morning and raised hostage issues with the president every morning in those meetings. So those were three themes um, that came through in the 2020 report, gaps in all three of those areas that uh, frankly says to me that we've got some warning signs here of slippage in terms of uh, how well we're doing on making sure these reforms are continuing uh, to, be, uh, to be implemented. Uh, when it comes to the disparate treatment between hostages and um, wrongful detainees, as I mentioned, the HRFC was envisioned to address both. That's precisely why the HRFC was constructed to include leadership from the State Department, um, as well as the FBI, as well as the Department of Defense. Um, so one question is, how is that being done? Is, has the State Department designated and staffed a senior person to be a, a part of the leadership at, at the HRFC? If not, they should be. Um, and uh, again, the HRFC was designed and intended to benefit both um, wrongful detainees as well as hostages. There is an appropriate distinction, as we've discussed, between those two classes, if you will, of, of uh, hostage and wrongful detainees. Um, when it comes to the FBI leading investigations to find where a hostage may be held and what their circumstances are, and when it comes to a wrongful detainee to lead the diplomatic strategy 
to deal with the government that we know is holding that person. They're differently situated, but it doesn't mean they should have any less uh, coordination and communication and care coming from the federal government. Um, so when it comes to the, rec the specific recommendation in the report to have a family engagement team at the State Department, I worry about that as a recommendation because I think it creates, it recreates um, a left hand, right hand, uh, not knowing what each other is doing, um, just like we had before the 2015 review. I would like to see um, the original uh, conception of the HRFC being that common central hub on all of these issues and the agencies that are, were supposed to dedicate staff and leadership to that HRFC doing so. Um, last, uh, last few points. When it comes to information sharing and the, and the frustrations that were expressed and revealed in, the, in this report that we're discussing today, um, in terms of the gaps that families feel that they're not getting information um, and uh, they're, they're not getting information declassified, et cetera. Here again, the HRFC was envisioned, as I said, as the central hub for information gathering and um, where all the intelligence about uh, particular hostage issues should go. And it also was given the mission uh, to ensure that information gets declassified and shared back out with families. The reforms, if we go back to the executive order and the PPD, uh, we specifically created a role and a job, something called the intelligence manager for hostage issues in the intelligence community. Um, I may have missed it, but I didn't see that referenced in the report. One question I would have for the current uh, director of national intelligence is who is the mission manager? Who is the intelligence uh, manager for hostage affairs? Is that, you know, what is that, what role is that person performing? They were created in the executive order. Um, it is a role that should be staffed um, and it should be, uh, one of its jobs is to identify information that can be shared back out with families. Uh, we made an explicit reference in the reforms in 2015 to doing uh, one-time read-ins, right, for families so that they could get classified information. How is that work being performed? Is that getting done? Uh, finally, uh, when it comes to coordination uh, and prioritizing and leadership at the White House, um, it will surprise no one to know that my view is when it comes to really fixing some of the gaps we're talking about to make, to make sure that policy that has been, been articulated by the White House is getting implemented across the government, that is the job of the White House. That is the job of the National Security Council. And it was envisioned as part of the role that the hostage response group plays. Um, and to the extent that's not getting done, that strikes me as uh, something that needs to be happening at the White House. So the hostage response group, again, set up, was set up to serve as that senior coordinating point uh, to ensure that all agencies are fulfilling their roles. Um, and if that's not happening, it's the job of the White House uh, to make sure that it happens. But that can only happen if you have a senior accountable individual who is, who is making sure that happens. So when it comes to the recommendation, that um, there should be an increase in the standing of the hostage recovery enterprise within the US government and an increased priority of hostages and wrongful detainee issues. I couldn't agree more. Um, the, the, uh, recommend, the specific recommendation that there be a new position at the National Security Advisor level uh, to champion hostage and wrongful detainee issues, I would make a friendly amendment to that recommendation. And my friendly amendment is not to create a new position, but rather to reinstate uh, the old position. Um, and here I will show my evident bias. My job as the Homeland Security Advisor and Counterterrorism Advisor to the President uh, was exactly what this report lays out, to ensure and be a champion for hostage issues inside the White House. Um, Unfortunately, we no longer have uh, an empowered 
uh, hot, um, Homeland Security Advisor, as far as I know, um, who operates at the National Security Advisor level. In other words, holds the rank of assistant to the president, uh, which is the rank uh, that I held. So uh, I think my friendly amendment would be is uh, the hostage response group should continue to operate. It should be run by the senior uh, director or the special assistant to the president for, um, for counterterrorism issues in the, in the National Security Council. But that person needs to have a direct uh, report uh, to somebody who is focused on these issues, who reports directly uh, to the president. Um, and so we can, we can get into questions about um, uh, and debate about that particular recommendation. But uh, I just want to close by thanking Cindy for the tremendous work that you did uh, to Diane and the Foley Foundation uh, for uh, commissioning this work uh, and for New America for holding this panel. Uh, Peter, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And uh, you know, we wouldn't be having this discussion in many ways if, if without your leadership and during the Obama administration to really uh, try and fix the system. Um, so thank you. Uh, Rachel, um, you're, you're up next. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, I want to first open by, of course, also thanking Diane, um, her colleagues at the Foley Foundation, New America, and Cindy for what is um, a really, really important piece of work. And I'm glad to see it happening for the second time annually. And I really hope that this is now an annual um, regular thing on the calendar because uh, review is important. Uh, it keeps all of us on our feet. And for those of us who care so deeply about hostage affairs, um, standards should keep going up and, and not go in the other direction. So I, I thank you. Um, I should also say as well that um, Diane was characteristically very modest in her description of Hostage US. And I should say that um, I wouldn't be here, Hostage US simply wouldn't exist if Diane hadn't fought fearlessly for the concept, um, for the funding, uh, for the access. Um, and I, I thank you so much for being a, um, a fearless champion for hostages and their families. And um, I've said it to you many times, I'll say it again now publicly in this forum. Um, it's one of the proudest uh, achievements um, that I will ever have um, serving Jim's legacy. And that's what Hostage US is. So uh, my deepest heartfelt thanks to you and your family. Um, five years on we're um we're here reviewing where we've come and i think the first thing i want to say is that we did really well um now i know how difficult it is for my teeny tiny little government in the united kingdom to change um the us government is a much bigger beast and so to bring about the kind of pivot that we saw pretty much overnight in 2015 and into 2016 is quite extraordinary and I think it does bear dwelling on that uh, even if just for a second to say the change that we have seen really has been wholesale it's been extraordinary and the fact that notwithstanding Lisa's um, very pertinent um, challenge to us all to make sure that things aren't slipping at all um, nevertheless, um, the improvements we've seen have been extraordinary. So I, I just wanted to, to note that um, firstly. Um, I wanted to um, really focus on three issues here, um, which the report so, uh, the first, the two of which the report so eloquently um, describe and then give us some very useful uh, solutions to them. So I firstly wanted to talk about uh, the situation with wrongful detainees, specifically uh, the situation in the State Department right now. Secondly, I wanted to talk about the plight of those returning from captivity. And then thirdly, um, in finishing, I just wanted to say something about my and my colleagues' experience in recent weeks of supporting families um, through this very uh, stressful time with um, what we're all facing, but, but not least what they're facing in the light of COVID-19 uh, crisis. So firstly, let me turn my attention to the issue of wrongful detainees. Um, I have to say that it was, um, it was fairly painful reading, actually, um, looking at the stark contrast between um, 
the uh, much more positive reflection from hostage families and what the report uh, showed with the, with the experiences of detainee families over, over this period. And I can absolutely say that it does, it is, uh, it chimes exactly with our experience uh, working with families and returned detainees as well. So I, I would absolutely echo those findings. That's exactly what we're seeing as well. Um, and I just wanted to call out um, the problem here at State Department. Um, you know, I was shocked. I mean, of course there's turnover of um, personnel. We know that's always a feature of government. Um, of, we know that there is a, there's been problems filling positions in the State Department and um, we sympathize with that. But hearing from families things like, we're experiencing infighting within the State Department. Um, I am not getting my full 30 minutes of a phone call with State De Department officials. I mean, 30 minutes? I mean, if you can't give 30 minutes to somebody whose child, husband, loved one is, is, is facing a perilous fate. Um, the, the person who talked about not having their phone calls and emails answered for five months. And then individuals talking about the fact that their feeling is, at least, that their case is not taken seriously until it gets some congressional interest. And, um, you know, Diane challenges us. She has this wonderful phrase that she uses, which is moral courage. She challenges us to have moral courage and call things out when change is needed. And I'm, I'm calling this out. And it's not good enough. It's unacceptable. And times are always difficult, but we've got to solve this problem. And if we could do it in 2015, and if we could bring about the scale of the change that we saw pretty much overnight. We have got the means, we've got the talent, we've got the good ideas, and we've certainly got people with enough heart to solve this problem. And I absolutely 100% endorse every single one of the report's recommendations about solving that. And I would absolutely endorse the idea that there needs to be a proper and full scale review of what's happening to those families. And we need to turn that situation around. We can do it. So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second is I just wanted to um, again touch on another issue which the report handled really well, which is um, the plight of people after release. Now, of course, our first most important priority is getting our people home. Um, our next important priority is, of course, making sure that they come home to a life that is full, that is one of recovery and is one of prosperity. And um, we know we know that hostages suffer in all sorts of ways when they come home, whether it's their physical health, their mental health and well-being, the fact that their credit ratings are shot and they can't get a credit card, they can't rent an apartment, they can't buy a car, um, they face isolation, they have been through a very extraordinary situation that many just simply can't relate to and, and it brings about great feelings of loneliness often on return. Um, and this, this takes years. I mean, this is not something that you bound back from overnight in weeks, in months. It takes, it quite literally takes years. And um, my organization works really hard with people in that situation to, with, through the amazing partnerships we have with hospitals, with lawyers, with financial advisors, wonderful support. And I know that Diane's organization also does amazing work with those who are coming back and need support. Um, I think it's time for us to coordinate it's time for us to really focus our attention on that challenge. Every single hostage or returning detainee needs what I would call a roadmap to recovery. They need that piece of paper, so to speak, that says, here's what's available, here's, where you here's how you access it, here's the how-to on the funds that are available, the phone numbers to, to call. My, my own organization had the opportunity to, to create something like that a, a number of years ago for a particular individual and and the feedback we got was extraordinary well we need that writ large that needs to be something that everybody coming back from captivity gets their own roadmap for recovery and so we stand ready to work with anybody in this space who wants to be a part of what i think would be a very um, positive development the third um thing i wanted to do is just um i mean i'm in an incredibly privileged position of in the role that I have of, of being able to support folks who are going through, as you can imagine, uh, terribly stressful times and uh, layer on top of that, what we are all facing now and the, the challenges for 
the families of uh, detainees and, and hostages are peaked, um, uh, to say the least, right now. And I wanted to share with you really three reflections from what we're seeing to give you a sense of just how this situation is, makes a bad situation unbearable right now. Um, like many of you, I'm sure you are worried about uh, family members overseas. I know I uh, worried about my elderly parents, making sure they're okay. Um, you know, swap for that as the situation that you're worried about your loved one in location unknown, held by people who have um, really bad motives and uh, likely not going to have any access to healthcare. Um, you may have seen a statement which was released last week by the families, the Whelan family. Uh, Paul Whelan is being held in, in Russia. He, his family had gone as far as to deliver PPE equipment to his prison and their request to have it delivered was denied. I mean, at the prison gates, they had to leave masks and, and sanitizing wipes and so on. Um, families are desperately worried about um, their own health, but particularly worried about the health of their loved ones who simply don't have the luxury that we do, that there's a hospital down the road should, should the worst happen. Um, the, second, uh, the second challenge is uh, for returning hostages. Um, the folks that we work with are hugely reliant for many months and, and often longer after they return to hospitals, to psychiatrists, to social services. Um, they're simply closing their doors right now. And so there is, there is a category of person right now, there's a cohort of people right now who are um, at various different stages of their recovery for whom that support has ceased and times are really, really difficult for them. Um, and then thirdly and, and finally, um, and, and this really hammers home the point about how long the, the sort of the, the long tail of, of recovery to these situations is. I received an email just yesterday from somebody whose loved one was released from captivity 10 years ago. And the heightened anxiety, the sense of worry, the sense of chaos around this individual had triggered again those PTSD problems um, that they had dealt with a decade prior. Um, the, this is a dreadful thing to uh, experience as a family. Um, it takes families a heck of a lot of courage to get through it. Um, it takes hostages and detainees a long time um, to recover. And um, I, I thank again um, the Foley Foundation, New America, and all of you for, for tuning in and being interested in caring. Um, because we've shown in 2015 we can make a difference, we can change things, we can do better. Um, the report highlights that there's areas where we need to keep working and um, it's just amazing to know that there's a, a, a bunch of people as talented as we have here um, ready to, to stand and, and fight the next fight. Thank you, Rachel. So we've had quite a lot of questions come in on the chat function, so thank you for those. And I'm going to kind of combine uh, a question I had with two of the questions that came in. Uh, uh, we've talked a lot about wrongful detentions, and I and this is a question uh, for everybody, but also particularly perhaps for, for Lisa, which is, I mean, there is a kind of slippery slope problem about defining what is a wrongful detention. Clearly, somebody like Jason Rezaian being held by the Iranian regime, uh, you know, <clears throat> it seems like a wrong, it is a wrongful detention. Uh, but there are cases which are perhaps, a, you know, a, when when NATO allies like Turkey are holding a, a pastor, uh, he may well be wrongfully detained or he may not, uh, depending on the situation, each of these situations. So that's kind of the, this first general question. And then we have a question from an anonymous uh, attendee who says that, uh, that they have heard that the State Department is choosing which cases to take on in, in, in this wrongfully de detained category. And then we also have a question from the sister of Paul Wellen, who's just been mentioned, who's been held uh, by, by the Russian Federation. Uh, the, the, Paul's sister says state has not declared him uh, wrongfully detained. Um, and you know, her basic question is, I need help for him now. Uh, so first of all, the high level question, and then the specific uh, questions about, does a, is the State Department picking and choosing to the extent that we know? And, and, and what about Paul Wellen's case? So thanks, Peter. I'll, I'll um, try to do those questions justice. First on the high level question, um, I think it ought to be 
possible to determine who is a quote unquote wrongful detainee. And, and I think our framework here ought to be, um, you know, are they being held by a government who, um, whose legal system that we recognize, we may not agree with how it's structured, we may, and we certainly will have different legal systems and the like, um, but is there some uh, fealty to any rule of law concept there, right? Um, if an American goes to another country and violates the laws of that country, um, they may be a quote unquote legitimate or a lawful detainee, but we may have real concerns about how their legal system is, is addressing uh, those, uh, that particular quote unquote violation. And that's what the diplomatic channels should be about, talking to, um, talking to the other government, ensuring that human rights um, protections are being uh, observed, et cetera. Where somebody is a wrongful detainee, it's where they are not being um, afforded uh, any international um, uh, appropriate protections for human rights, uh, international law being observed, um, where I suspect we would take issue with the, uh, the rationale being advanced by the government for that person's detention. Jason Rezaian is a perfect uh, example, and I suspect also Paul Whelan would be a good example, uh, where we as a government do not agree that uh, they are rightfully being detained. Um, instead, they are being detained on trumped up uh, or fanciful charges created by a government uh, that we believe is not observing the rule of law and is using uh, this detention as a way to extract some other type of agenda for, for our government. Uh, and here I'll go uh, to the next two sets of questions and I'll do it very briefly. Uh, with regard to picking and choosing, I don't know what the State Department is doing. I don't know what approach it is taking. I don't know how transparent they're being. I suspect that is, and I think that's really what's animating some of the findings in the report that we're discussing today. Uh, but there ought to be an ability to be transparent. It ought to be the role of consular affairs. It ought to be the role of the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs to answer exactly those questions and to do so on a regular basis. Uh, for the families of those who are held uh, unlawfully abroad. Um, and with regard to Mr. Whalen's case, um, first, my um, heartfelt um, sympathies to the family who are enduring um, his long detention. In my own view, I don't understand why we wouldn't be raising his case at every juncture, at every level uh, from our government to the government of the Russian Federation. Uh, I, I think it would not be too much to say that the president, every time he speaks to President Putin, should raise um, the issue of Paul Whelan and you know, why is he being detained? What is being done to ensure he is afforded uh, human rights protections? He is getting uh, appropriate visits. He can get uh, communication uh, with his family members. He can get that type of uh, uh, PPE uh, given the, the coronavirus, et cetera. So uh, it seems to me uh, that th there is no reason why our government shouldn't be making a statement uh, about his detention and raising it at all levels uh, constantly with the Russian government. Uh, any other thoughts on, on those questions? Thank you, Lisa. Um, here, uh, here's a question from, from, from John Foley, um, which is related to this question that Cindy raised, that, uh, you know, this question of declassification that Lisa also talked about. Because uh, I, I might, you know, I, I as as a sort of somebody who has a surface knowledge about a lot of this, my impression was that the reforms that came about in 2015 really, as you said, Lisa, uh, effectively allowed um, declassification to families who have a very strong uh, incentive not to, you know, use that information in any public manner. Um, so it's sort of surprising. That does seem like a uh, you know, kind of a, a, a reversal uh, of, of something that made a lot of sense. And, and, and John's question is, what approach should be used to better utilize the DNI manager that you mentioned, Lisa, and HFRC, HFRC to get needed information to families? So that's a, a general question. 
so, so I'll start and, and then um, I'm sure uh, Rachel and Cindy may have perspectives on this. First, uh, hello to my friend John. Uh, great to, to uh, see you out the, in the ether, so to speak. Um, so I think the first question is, who is the intelligence manager? Um, who, who performs that role? I personally can't name that person. Um, I would, uh, it would be good to know uh, who holds that role. Uh, and pose this question uh, directly uh, to that professional, uh, and then uh, go back to the kind of founding documents, if you will, uh, and and hold uh, hold the government to to account for this. So uh, the role, as envisioned, was to have an intelligence manager who makes sure that information intelligence is being shared with the HRFC and the and the uh, agencies all uh, who have representatives there and very specifically to review that information to see what can be shared with uh, families of hostages and unlawful detainees. Now, uh, the or and this is where the orientation shift comes in. Um, when President Obama announced the 2015 reforms, we announced at the same time a shift in our orientation, that the default would be to try and share as much information as possible as opposed to the default being, no, we're going to withhold and only parcel things out. Now, the devil is so clearly in the details on something like this, but that's why there needs to be a, a good source of communication within the HRFC and to have a clear uh, place of accountability with the intelligence manager. Peter, I might come in if that's okay. Yeah. Um, absolutely agree with, with all of that. Um, just uh, three three things I would say on the issue of um, intelligence information sharing with families as, as I have experienced it. Um, the first is to say that um, I think it's, and I think it's right to acknowledge this, that um, in certainly in the first couple of years um, of, of this new regime, if you like, sort of 2015, 2016-ish, um, I, what I saw was a a government trying to come to grips with how to do this. And I, I could see that from a government perspective. Um, you have a lot of people who are used to particular ways of working, particular types of sensitivities, and, and you're effectively asking them to change how they work. So I, I did see up close and personal, you know, very dedicated professionals trying to battle with this. Um, and, and working really hard to, to exactly get to the point that, that Lisa is, is describing here. So I, I think it's fair to say that, that there has been kind of steady, steady, steady improvement as the people working uh, within certain parts of government has, have worked really hard to, to make this possible. It, it, it's new, it's difficult, it kind of wrinkles against everything that people have been trained to do, but they're working hard to try to, to make it happen in, in many instances. So I think there's been a change over time, certainly more room for improvement, um, and it's something we continue to push on, but I have seen a shift in it. Um, the second uh, thing it, that I would say is that I've been working with hostage families for at least 10 years, if not 15, and I can tell you from experience, um, I have never come across a family that has misused sensitive information that they have been given. Because surprise, surprise, they are the person in this equation that has the least interest in misusing that information. And I have seen in many, you know, in a number of situations in, in many different countries where I've worked, government sharing stuff that I was surprised they were sharing and families treated it with the respect that it deserved. And um, so I think there's a, a, a sort of slightly misplaced worry about this. Um, and, and we have to keep pushing against that, that kind of cultural um, allergic reaction to, to the concept, uh, I would say. Um, and then the third, the third thing is that um, one of the things that we see and I, I think we saw this in the report as well, was that um, government officials can always do a better job of helping families to understand what the limitations of what they can tell them are and why. Um, you know, a simple, you know, I just can't tell you that because of national security says, I don't trust you um, and, I, and I'm, you know, behaving like a robot. <laughs> what, what families uh, want to hear is, 
help me understand why, help me understand when it becomes difficult, help me understand how I treat this information. Um, and what we see um, of the families we work with in their interactions of, of government is when they really, really understand the, 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 the why question, um, there's, there's a lot more elasticity in that relationship. Um, and, and there's a sort of a two, much more of a two way understanding of that. Now, I always push government to go further. I think there is much further that, that, that it can go. Um, but I, I don't think you can underestimate the, the need for, for government folks working on this to really take the time to work with families to, so that folks properly understand what the sensitivities are and why. Um, and, and that relationship works a lot better in, the, in those situations. Thank you. So um, for, I just want to thank our 130 participants uh, who uh, called in and also all the people who've submitted questions. We have uh, 15 minutes left, so we just want to try and get to as many of these questions as possible. Um, uh, one question, you know, does the coronavirus crisis, um, is it sort of a wedge that can actually produce better outcomes? Uh, is there any precedent for sort of an international crisis like this facilitating negotiations for release? It's a, it's a very good question. I'm, I'm kind of racking my brain for thinking uh, to identify any precedent uh, that's on point here, given the, the unprecedented nature of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, I'm, I'm not coming up with direct precedent, but I do think it is something that we uh, and our government should be both pointing to using uh, particularly in cases of wrongful detainees. So the, the, you know, mm. the very disturbing point that the Whelans uh, make that they tried uh, to get uh, PPE uh, and protection uh, to uh, their family member being held uh, in Russia and, and getting stiff armed, um, that should just frankly be completely unacceptable um, by our government. And, um, you know, the State Department should be raising that directly uh, with the foreign minister uh, going direct to now they may be doing that. I don't know. But then they should be informing, it seems to me, the family that that's what they're doing. And if they're not letting that equipment in to the prison, then they should be getting assurances from the Russians that um, they're taking precautions inside. So it ought to absolutely be a direct subject. Uh, of discussion and, and a point that our government raises at the highest levels. We have a question here from Jason Poblik. Um, and I think he asks two very good questions. One, the question of accountability. It seems that, you know, uh, obviously uh, a lot of these cases, there isn't much accountability. Is there a way to fix that uh, is, is one question. And then he also suggests that um, there's a fair amount of private diplomacy taking place and sometimes it's, you know, kind of a cross currents with the USG. Uh, my impression, uh, you know, certainly uh, of private diplomacy, the people that we know is that they do coordinate very carefully with USG and tell them everything they're doing. Uh, but is that a fair um, uh, question to, as we are now at year five uh, of this uh, kind of new uh, process? So on the private diplomacy piece, um, I obviously don't know uh, much, if anything, about what's going on now uh, and what is being shared with the, with the government. In my past experience, I think there absolutely is a role for private diplomacy, um, and it can be quite useful. And, um, but as you say, Peter, it's very important that that be, um, if not coordinated, at least informed, uh, there be information sharing with the government about those efforts. And that was my experience, that um, there was uh, an effort to coordinate and inform the government about those private uh, diplomacy efforts. Uh, and, and they shouldn't be working at cross currents. That, that would be um, to the detriment, potentially, of the, the hostage or detainee and their families. And that always has to take priority. So there's, there is a role, in my view, for private diplomacy. There ought to be coordination and information sharing. And if you've got the, the right people in the right places to do that discussion, uh, I think it can be quite useful. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions, one from an anonymous attendee um, and another from a gentleman nicknamed Scott. 
Uh, the first question from the enormous attendee is, you know, how can regular citizens help uh, donate to the foundations, uh, the Foley Foundation, the Hostage US? I think we can safely say yes to that. Calling our representatives, can you share some practical steps? And a kind of related question, um, is there anything we can take from hostage response in the UK or elsewhere that should be implemented here in the United States? Are, are there best practices? Obviously, um, you know, New America has done some work on the question of uh, you know, countries that do, do or do not pay ransoms, uh, clearly they're better outcomes. So the UK and US has uh, no, <clears throat> you know, um, has a much more stringent uh, policy around that. Um, so are there best practices from other countries and what can ordinary people do to help? So I endorse your directives uh, or your suggestions to what private citizens can do uh, and heartily endorse donations to Hostage US and to the Foley Foundation. Um, I, uh, on the question of best practices from the UK, um, I'm, I'll only be slightly facetious here. I think we've imported the best practice from the UK and her name was Rachel Briggs. Hmm. Um, uh, in uh, my experience as part of the review uh, that we did in 2015, I traveled to the UK to talk to my counterparts there uh, to gain some lessons learned about how the UK uh, was addressing these issues. And in that, um, and on that trip uh, and in that meeting with UK officials, they asked somebody to join and that person was Rachel Briggs and, uh, and she told me about the work she was doing for Hostage UK. Uh, and so I think it, it is a, it's a great uh, credit to her uh, that uh, there was a, a real need uh, here in the US for that type of, for that type of work. So. Any other thoughts about best practices from other countries that that we can learn from? So I might just um, <clears throat> jump in if that's okay. Um, on on the, the UK side of things, I have to, um, I'm ashamed to say I'm slightly out of touch with what's going on in my own country right now. Um, but um, certainly I, I think two of the things that um, I was always so proud of working in the UK, which I'm incredibly pleased that we now have in the US is we always had in the UK something called the special cases unit within the foreign office, which again, our government is much smaller than, than yours, but it was an attempt to create a unit right at the heart of our, our equivalent to the state department um, that would do that bringing together that coordination. Um, and that was also the unit that does, did, and, and presumably still does the front facing work with, with families run by um, really an exceptional human being. Um, and an amazing team. So I think that was an important um, lesson from there. And also I've mentioned it already, but the, the, the very trusting open relationships that I just marveled at every time I saw them uh, between government officials and families um, at really the most difficult times as well. To see that in, in practice is, is really something quite special. So um, I, I greatly, um, some of you may have read um, Joel Simon's book, um, which um, take, is, is another attempt to look internationally at what's happening. And, and I think the more that we can all share with one another what's, what works and what doesn't, uh, the, the better. And I should also mention um, a couple of things in terms of how citizens can help. One is that I would add Hostage International into that bracket of, of organisations. Hostage UK is now Hostage International and is working everywhere outside of the US actually to help um, citizens from all over the world who find themselves um, taken. Um, so important sister organizations to us both. Um, and, and a point that I, I was thinking about making earlier, which is, which is one of narrative. And um, I don't come across this, I think, nearly as often as most people would do because of the work I do. Um, but I'm still kind of shocked when, um, people ask me questions about um, the level of sympathy we should have with hostages. You know, mm. But why were they there? You know, why were they in X country that they knew was dangerous? And um, what we know is that we need journalists, we need brave humanitarians, we need international trade, not much of it happening right now, of course, but these are all things we need in our world to function. And um, hostages find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. And one thing that any committed citizen can do, as well as all of the above, is actually to help ensure we're telling the right story about hostage taking and um, to, to share, share those stories, ensure that what we have is a public narrative of sympathy and empathy 
rather than judgment and criticism. Um, and um, I, I think that's a, a really, really important thing that ordinary citizens can do to help shape the way that we all understand these issues. Because if, if we don't understand this properly, we're not going to get Congress to work. We're not going to get big bureaucracies to change. We're not going to get people to, you know, think about where money is allocated in the budget each year. Um, so ordinary citizens really do have a, 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 an important role to play in, in helping to, to frame that debate in the right way. Um, if I could just jump in, I'm sorry, I noticed that Diane Foley unfortunately lost her connection and I just want to uh, volunteer um, myself as executive director of the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation to continue the conversation. Um, I think that one other point um, to this question of how can regular citizens help um, lobby your members of Congress because there is a piece of legislation called the Levinson Act, named for Bob Levinson, um, that is in the House and the Senate that is supposed to uh, codify the reforms made in 2015 that we've been discussing today, but also um, include a uh, criteria for wrongful detention of Americans who are being held by foreign governments, which can be incredibly helpful in making that uh, transparent and uh, applicable to all families who need it. Um, and so that's another way that um, ordinary citizens can get involved by lobbying their members of Congress and saying, it's not just when you have a constituent who is being held hostage or wrongfully detained, this impacts all of us. As Rachel said, um, any American traveling, working overseas could be the next hostage or the next wrongful detainee. It seems like it impacts a small number of people, but it actually, really could impact all of us because we live in a global world and we cannot leave our fellow Americans behind. We, we need to care about each other and make sure that our government knows how much we care about our fellow citizens because it's really one of the best ways to, uh, to push along progress in releasing some of these cases. And that's what we're trying to do by raising awareness on these individual cases um, and, and also trying to engage with actors in the government about what are the things that need to be addressed. With the, with the few minutes remaining, uh, are there any kind of closing thoughts, Cindy, uh, since it's your report? Do you, um, is there something you'd like to, to add to the discussion here? I, I did want to add something to um, what Lisa asked and when she was, when she was sharing. Um, with basically we're going back to intelligence sharing. I do want to add that looking at both of our reports from the previous report to this year's report, there is, a, there is an improvement um, of information that is sharing uh, from what I've what I've observed and the issue manager at that time I don't think she's there anymore it was Barbara Groves and she, I know she worked very hard to to get that ball rolling I don't know who's continuing that effort uh, but something that Lisa mentioned was do families receive a one-time readings that is occurring however the problem is that family member you know, whether it's a spouse or a daughter or, a ch you know, a child, they can't share that information with whoever's working on behalf for them with the case. For example, if they have a hostage negotiator, that information cannot get outside. So it's, 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 it's becoming stale, if you will, and time goes on and it's really impeding progress to bringing um, these their loved ones home. So I just wanted to add that because I think that's very important about well, Cindy, information Cindy, sharing. Cindy, can I ask you a clarification? So and uh, is it that, so the family is getting a one-time read-in of what the intelligence uh, is? Uh, is that right? But, and yeah, but obviously these cases can go on for years. That information then becomes kind of dated. Yes, right. they are receiving classified information um, that they can only share. Uh, with that family member, but you're, you have a family member that could be sitting in the middle, middle of, I'm, I'm making this up, but somewhere in the middle of Kansas and their loved ones being held overseas. They can't do anything with that information. They're not allowed to share it. They can't share that information with their negotiators or whoever else is working on their case to bring their loved ones home. So it's really breaking and blocking that communication change, chain. Well, uh, I think we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank Rachel uh, Briggs, Lisa Monaco, uh, Cindy uh, Lurcher for her report, uh, Diane Foley, who unfortunately uh, had some had a drop off, and Margot Ewan 
uh, and uh, thank you everybody for, for calling in uh, to, for this important discussion. Thank you.